morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another episode. Working on open shift. And, and sometimes we have This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it, believes in the place of It's actually a piece of the component for your get up. Everybody has something that they can say. On top of the Red Hat portfolio. Evening, wherever you happen to may be. Uh, and just in case that got cut off, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, so, first of all, welcome to today's Ask an OpenShift Administrator live stream. So, you'll probably notice something pretty substantially different today. And that is that, well, I'm here by myself. I don't have my, uh, my longtime co host slash uh, helper slash question asker slash keeping Andrew honest co-host with me, uh, Chris Shorts. So if you happen to miss that announcement, uh, so last week, Chris and Stu Miniman did a stream here on Red Hat Live Streaming that talked about basically the future and more specifically Chris's future as well as the past. Uh, and if you aren't aware, Chris has decided to pursue an opportunity outside of Red Hat. So congratulations to him. Thank you so much, Chris, for all of the help, all of the work, all of the things that we have been able to achieve together. Uh, you will be severely missed, but the good news is I am not alone. Uh, so I, it doesn't mean that I am completely by myself. Instead, we have uh, a, a producer who has been helping us behind the scenes for quite some time, uh, and she has been kind enough to kind of step up and really take the reins here. So. You see sometimes those chat messages that come from like the Red Hat official accounts and or the Red Hat OpenShift account and stuff like that. That is Stephanie. Stephanie is the producer that's working in the background there. So say hi to her, say thank you to her. She is the one who kind of keeps me organized in the background and will help me to hopefully uh, keep on top of things. So I will also point out that, um, yes, this is, uh, there's a lot of things going on on my monitor right now. So my apologies if I happen to miss your questions or something like that. Um, if I, I don't see them um, after a few minutes, please don't hesitate to, uh, you know, call me out and be like, hey, you know, a Andrew, you missed this. You know, can you can you please address my question type of thing? And I'll, I'll be sure to get to that. So, um, yes, again, congratulations, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for acknowledging that. Um, I don't know whether or not he's watching, but I am very happy to uh, poke him in the background. You can also find him. He's still on social media and everything at the same place that he has always been. Um, so by all means, um, say hi to him if you so choose. Uh, so this is the Ask an OpenShift Administrator office hour. And the office hour live streams are part of Red Hat Live Streaming, where our goal is to be here for you. Right? This is an opportunity for you to ask any questions, talk about things that are top of mind for you uh, with regard to anything OpenShift related. Uh, so I have a uh, kind of extensive, or at least I like to think it's extensive, uh, administrator background, uh, as well as most of my focus and responsibilities here inside of Red Hat is on the administrative side, kind of all of those things below applications inside of OpenShift. So that's what we're here to talk about. And the term or the name office hours comes from if you ever had, you know, a manager or a professor or a, a teacher or something like that who had office hours, right? It's intended for you to be able to come and talk about whatever you need to talk about. So anything that's top of mind, anything that you'd like to ask about, by all means, please bring it up and we'll be happy to address that, uh, regardless of whatever it is the topic of the day happens to be. So you'll also notice that with every one of these streams, and these happen weekly, uh, we have a theme or a topic that we try and focus on. And today, that is OpenShift 4.9. So you probably, or I hope you are aware that a couple of weeks ago here on Red Hat Live Streaming, we hosted the What's New in OpenShift 4.9 presentation. Uh, it's a two hour long presentation that's given by the entire product management team for OpenShift. Effectively, they go through all of the things that have happened in 4.9. They give you a quick little blurb, you know, that, that one slide highlight of what's changed. Uh, and then we try and cram as much of that as we possibly can in, you know, understanding that Engineering has put, you know, three plus months of effort into a release. So there, there's a lot of things that change and we try and pull out those highlights. So with that in mind, we 
kind of want to condense that even further here on Ask an OpenShift Admin. We want to focus on things that uh, are relevant, are important to us as administrators. Uh, you know, there's a lot of changes that are hoping for, uh, uh, or a lot of changes to things that are developer centric or maybe not necessarily relevant to us admins. So we want to pull those out and, and make sure that you're aware of them. Uh, Edub, yes, I, I hope so as well. Um, I, that, that's actually one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, so I, I'll talk about that in just a few minutes when we get to our top of mind topics uh, on the on the stream. So uh, housekeeping wise, again, um, sorry to see Chris go. You know, see, thanks for all the fish. Um, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for all your help. I see you in the chat already. So. Um, by all means, please don't hesitate to interact with her and she will uh, you know, keep up with all the things that are going on there. Uh, and with that, I will, I guess I won't dilly dally any longer. Um, I won't, it's, it's just not the same to ramble with myself. Uh, do, do be aware, however, um, that I am looking for and I have a good candidate for a co-host in mind already. So I may not be my, by myself here for too long. We may have somebody else joining us. So Keep an eye out for updates on that. All right, uh, so things to talk about, top of mind topics, which is kind of a reoccurring segment that we have here on the stream, where we talk about things that have happened recently within the last couple of weeks, basically since the last stream, that are important or relevant, as well as things that are kind of re real-time reactions or real-time information that you need. The first one of those is a bit self-serving, uh, and that is, uh, well, I probably won't have a stream next week. Uh, so if you weren't aware, uh, Red Hat Summit this year was pretty different than in you know normal years. So we had the first summit, if you will, back in April. It was primarily led by, or it primarily was leadership folks talking about you know strategy and big picture things. Then in June, we had a second summit, right? Or summit part two, if you will. Uh, where we had some more technical sessions and stuff like that. It was hosted very much like uh, Summit was last year, right? Where you joined um, all of those mostly pre-recorded, some pseudo live, some fully live sessions happening on, I don't even remember the platform now, but it's all at summit.redhat.com. Uh, and then what we are now in the midst of is Summit Part 3. Uh, you, If you are a, if you have any of your Red Hat or any of your email addresses associated with Red Hat, you have probably heard or gotten emails about this uh, part three of Summit, which is, I think it's called Summit Connect. The goal is for us to be at various sites throughout, um, particularly North America. I don't know if it's all across the world or not, but uh, it's kind of all over the place. Um, so one of those happens to be here in Raleigh where I'm located and next Wednesday is when it's happening and I am a presenter for an Ask the Expert session. So if you happen to be in the Raleigh area uh, and you want to attend that, um, by all means, come out, come see us. Uh, it's an all day thing. I think I have to be there for my first booth duty session. Wow, I haven't had booth duty in like two years. So that'll be interesting. Uh, but you know, my first, bo first booth duty starts at like 7 a.m. or something. Um, Andrew's not an early morning person. We'll see how that goes. Um, so let's see, uh, just catching up on chat here. Um, Steven, congrats on the upgrade to 4.9. Um, yes, I've had a few clusters running. One of the things I want to look at today is some of the UX changes, um, which I am still discovering. Um, it's kind of funny that despite the fact our team, the tech marketing team, has a monthly meeting with the UX team, I'm still surprised by all the things that they managed to cram in there. Uh, so I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring some more about 4.9 as we go. Um, I also see you asking uh, if you had to choose between YouTube or Twitch. Uh, really, we have no preference. Um, so if you didn't know, we stream the uh, we stream to Twitch. We stream to two separate YouTube channels. One is the OpenShift channel. One is the Red Hat channel. Which one of those you choose is completely up to you. It makes no difference to us. And the technology we use in the background, Restream, uh, it also rebroadcasts all of your chat messages across all of those. So kind of wherever you're at, whichever one you choose, that's the right one to use. Um, you can also look at, we also have a Discord channel that you can use. All of the chat is accumulated into Discord. You can chat through there as well. Um, and some of us are, are I, at least I, I infrequently hang out there. Um, you know, Langdon, when he was still here doing the level up hour, he used to spend a lot of time in there. Um, and also, you know, if, if you don't mind, be sure to subscribe to all the various channels. Uh, I know sometimes it can get a little bit noisy. 
I don't know if it's possible to limit those YouTube notifications or anything like that, um, but it is nice to, uh, to get a reminder. Well, nice for me anyways. Um, yeah, Twitch is the better, better alternative. I will say that one of the big differences between YouTube and Twitch is the chat messages. Uh, so YouTube limits chat to 200 characters, um, whereas Twitch does not. So I, I try to, if I'm chatting on Twitch, I try to be cognizant of that and keep my messages a little bit shorter uh, because over on YouTube, they just end with an ellipsis, the three dots, and you don't know what the rest of the message happens to say. So maybe just be cognizant of that if you're, uh, if you're on Twitch and trying to communicate with somebody on YouTube. Um, so second thing, so reminder, next week, there will be no stream, um, almost certainly no stream unless something happens. Uh, keep an eye on the streaming calendar for any updates there. If it happens to get canceled, we'll basically remove it from the streaming calendar. Uh, so you can keep an eye out on that as that one single place. Uh, next on my list is what I think is a pretty big change here. And this is something that I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about. So let's share my window here, and we're going to share this one. And what you should be seeing now is the overview page for a cluster. And what I want to bring up is this particular blog post. I'm going to post this into chat over here. So this blog post is comes from our product management team, and it is effectively describing that we are changing the way that EUS, or Extended Update Support, works for OpenShift. So historically, OpenShift, right, up until uh, OpenShift's only EUS release thus far has been 4.6. I won't say only, only in the 4.x line. Uh, 3.11, of course, is EUS as well. So... With 4.6, uh, you needed a premium subscription. With that, you received uh, EUS support, which means that you could choose to stay on 4.6 until that EUS ends, basically until the next EUS comes out, uh, and then you can make that update. So with the release of 4.9, remember our support policy is N minus two, so 4.9 minus one is 4.8, minus two is 4.7. So those are the three officially fully supported or uh, the, the three officially supported releases. 4.6 is no longer supported unless you're using EUS. So the change here is that we are now announcing, we're now going to have every even release. So 4.8, 4.10, 4.12, and so on, be an EUS release. You will also no longer be required to have a premium subscription to utilize the EUS channel. So if you read through this blog post, and the blog post is, uh, so Mike Barrett, the author here, does a pretty good job of explaining a lot of different things inside of here, uh, including kind of why we did this, how we came up with the specific time frame, some of the requests that we we're hearing from you, from our customers. Um, so if, if you think about this, effectively, every release will now be supported for 18 months. And you might be asking, well, if every release, and we explain this in the blog post, if every release is supported for 18 months, what's the difference between an EUS release and a non-EUS release? And the answer to that is how updates are going to be done in the future. So let's say that today I am on OpenShift 4.8. 4.8 right? being an even release is EUS, which means that I can stay on that release until 4.10. 4.10 is an EUS. When that happens, when I update the cluster, what we'll do is effectively pause updates on the compute nodes, update the control plane, which has to be done serially to account for things like API changes and all of that. So the control plane will go from 4.8 to 4.9 to 4.10, and then it will unpause the compute nodes. That way the compute nodes can go straight from 4.8 to 4.10. And this can have a pretty significant impact on the amount of time it takes for you to achieve that update. Uh, so I was just chatting with some folks internally this morning. They were saying that their, one of their customers who has, I think it was 50, it was either 50 or 150 nodes in their cluster. It took them three days just for the nodes to be able to do the drain and reboot process. So if I'm going from 4.8 to 4.10 in a serial fashion, right, that's two three-day periods. I'll say that it wasn't three solid days. It was three days only during whatever their maintenance windows were, which I think were eight hours long or something like that. So effectively 24 working hours. 
Uh, so, you know, that's two, two of those periods that they have to go through, as opposed to with this new process, this kind of skip level or skip update for the compute nodes, right? We reduce that down to just one of those updates. So that's really going to be the big benefit of an EUS release is having that uh, uh, validated, if you will, skip update process associated with it. So I definitely encourage you, you know, please, if you have a moment, go through, read the blog post. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can always reach out to me, uh, social media. So Practical Andrew, if you just saw me chat uh, on Twitch a moment ago, all one word. Uh, so Twitter is Practical Andrew, just like my username there. You can also contact me via, via email at any time, uh, andrew.sullivan at redhat.com. So Again, please don't hesitate to reach out if there's any questions there. Um, I think we're working on an FAQ in the background. So for any Red Hatters who happen to be watching, please don't hesitate to reach out um, as well. You know, we'll make sure to include all of that information out. Um, I don't know if we'll update the blog post with some of those FAQ questions or if we'll create a separate document or something like that. But just be aware, you know, please, any questions you have, don't hesitate to ask. Um, our hope nine will it also go from say dot six, seven, eight to 10. Uh, so that is a, a question that I have at the moment. Uh, so if we look at this blog post, um, somewhere in this blog post, it says that we didn't start that qualification process until, uh, 4.8. And I'm not going to scroll through and read this entire thing, but somewhere in here, it basically says that, um, it didn't start until 4.8. And what my, my question is, and several others have had this as well. Um, so let's see here, it, it's somewhere right in here. Um, anyway, so basically my question is, if you're on 4.6 EUS today, can you use this same update mechanism to get to 4.8 and then in the future 4.8 to 4.10? Or will you have to follow the original update process for 4.6 US. Uh, so to be clear, the original update process was, you know, we would have a defined path of updates. So for example, let's say that the we didn't make this change and the next US was 4.10. So when 4.10 came out, we would have 4.6 US and then 4.8, 4.9, 4.10 would be the supported versions. So you would have a supported path of going from 4.6 something to 4.7 dot something, even though that 4.7 dot something isn't a supported release, it's supported in the context of a landing spot for that EUS upgrade path. And then on to 4.8, 4.9, 4.10. So whether or not that linear or, or sequential rather 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 has to happen, and then you can do the 4.8 to 4.10. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm, I'm working on an answer for that. Hopefully if we have, or if we know that um, before I create the blog post, which will go out tomorrow. Well, I, I send it tomorrow afternoon. It will get published uh, Friday morning. Um, so if I have an answer for that, I'll include it in the blog post. So keep an eye out on, what is it? Cloud.redhat.com slash blog now. I have to think about it because it just changed from openshift.com slash blog. Uh, I'm guessing there might be unique issues not yet envisioned. Uh, Arhob9, I am sure you are right. Uh, there's always some unexpected things. Um, you know, our, our QA, QE folks are really good. They test a lot of scenarios, um, but there are, you know, many, 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 many customers, many clusters, you know, ma many more clusters than customers. Um, so we always find those kind of edge cases, other things that crop up uh, as they go on. All right, uh, so next thing on my list here, and uh, don't hesitate to ask those questions if you have any here in the chat, I'll try and keep up with those. Um, yeah, I, I, our hope nine, I saw that as well this morning. Um, the OpenShift releases page on console at redhat.com still says that. I don't know how long it'll take them to catch up with that on the back end systems, um, but keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, so next up here, um, a, a question that came up a couple of times. Um, so just very quickly, so this is my uh, 4.9 cluster. You can see it's 4.9.0. Uh, if I were to go up here to the command line tools, and if I click to download these command line tools, um, so let's just, I'm going to copy the link. And I don't know if you all will be able to see it. Probably not. It's pretty tiny here. Um, essentially, if you were to download these tools, 
expand the tar or the, the zip file, whatever it is that gets downloaded, uh, what you'll see is if you do like an OC version, it'll say, you know, OC version 4.8 dot something or 4.8 dot zero dash blah, 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 blah. Even if you're running a 4.8 dot 12 or a 4.8 dot 14 cluster. So it looks like the version of the CLI tools that you download from inside the cluster here is a mismatch with the version of the actual cluster. However, the only it, it's a mismatch in name only. So the way that engineering explained this to me is effectively all of the builds happen inside, basically, uh, they're decoupled from the version. So they go through and they get a version string that's something like, you know, 4.8.0 dash date timestamp of when the build is happening. And it's not until after it goes through the process and becomes you know, a, a fully approved build and that it's assigned a build number. And because these tools are extracted from one of the images that's built, that version number doesn't make it all the way into that already built, already existing container. So yes, they look different, but in reality, they are an exact precise match for this particular version. Uh, and you can kind of ignore that version mismatch that you happen to see if you are doing that. Um, and actually, I wonder if I were to use the command line terminal, if it would show the same thing, because I think it pulls the tools from the same place. So let's check that out real quick. In case you're not familiar, um, so I, I click this little thing up here in the corner and it's opening a command line terminal for my cluster. Uh, that's actually an operator. Uh, so if you go to the, uh, the web terminal operator, uh, let's minimize that. And if I search for terminal, you can install this web terminal operator. And it gives you this link up here uh, after it installs, just refresh the console page. And then you have this really convenient, uh, well, as soon as I get it to come up. So let's see version. Um, yeah, so this one, actually this one doesn't look like it's been updated. So I wonder if it's pulling the tools image instead of pulling the one that's inside of the cluster. So that's interesting, I, I had noticed that. Uh, so uh, our hope nine to your point earlier of things that are still falling out um, from the update process, it looks like this pod simply hasn't been updated yet. Um, with that in mind, I also uh, wanna point out that, uh, actually I'll talk about that in a minute, minute which is uh, upgrades to 4.9, because I first wanna talk about upgrades from 4.7 to 4.8. Uh, so if you are currently on a 4.8 cluster, please know that, or excuse me, a 4.7 cluster, please know that uh, updates have been blocked again. So do I have this open? Oh, I do. Uh, so I think I've talked about this before, but I just wanna reiterate, if you're not subscribed to Errata, uh, so I'm just gonna, I just clicked this button here. This is simply access.com or access.redhat.com slash Errata. Uh, so if you're logged in, you have this notifications preferences button you can click on this and it'll come in here eventually. Uh, anyways, so it'll ask you, you know, what, what errata notifications you want to get. You can see I have mine innate or disabled because it sends you errata notifications for all products associated with your account. Uh, so as an employee, we have basically every product associated with our account, which means that we get a lot of errata. Um, so I just disabled mine. Uh, but you, I would suggest enabling those notifications and then using like client side filtering, you know, Gmail or Outlook or whatever you're using uh, to filter those down. And what you want to look for is these uh, with a synopsis where it says notification of blocked edges. Uh, so in this instance, we have a bug um, that I'm now forgetting what is actually the content of the bug. Um, we can come in here. Uh, we'll open the BZ here. Uh, anyways, there's now a bug. Oh, egress IPs are not being scheduled. Uh, so they decided to make this a blocker uh, for those updates. I believe the fix has already been created and is in the current candidate uh, for 4.7, 4.8. So hopefully these will be unblocked soon. Um, but nevertheless, at this moment, uh, the updates from 4.7 to 4.8 are blocked again, uh, at least temporarily. So let me catch up on Slack here. Um, Stephanie, thank you for posting that link. I appreciate it. 
and we'll close out of some of these tabs so I can keep organized. And then we will move over to this week's topic. So if you have any questions, please, again, be sure to highlight those in chat. I'm trying to keep up and make sure that we are um, answering all of those as they come up. Uh, again, if I happen to miss your question, um, you know, after a couple minutes, don't be afraid to raise it again. Um, but today we want to talk about 4.9 and some of the new features, new things that have come out in 4.9 that are really specific or really interesting to us as administrators. Um, our hope nine don't want to de derail a conversation. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, do you know why do the RPMs require the OpenShift broker slash master infrastructure to enable? Um, I don't. I'll, I'll see if I can find an answer for that for you. Um, I hadn't heard that before, so. Um, uh, Edub, uh, I often like to work in multiple clusters at the same time. How do you recommend accessing multiple UI or CLI shells across them in a graceful way that doesn't have potential for corruption? Um, that's a hard one. And it's not, it, if you look at my command, command line prompt, um, let me see if I can share this. Um, let's see, let's stop that one. And then we want to share this one. So my command line prompt here, um, you, you see I use colors and stuff like that. I'll, I'll actually utilize different colors and even change my terminal backgrounds to represent which color that or which cluster rather that I'm connected to um, because it can be confusing. And of course, you can also use the OC, who am I? Um, oh, and I can see I'm not actually connected to. I didn't export my kube config here. Uh, but anyways, um, that... That is how I help keep organized. Um, that's an old habit from a long time ago, um, <laughs> literally way back in the uh, ESX, ESX, not ESXi, like 3.x days when we used to have to SSH into them for um, pretty regular things. So that may not be the best way. That's just the way that I've identified to use it. Um, there are some tools, you know, as we were just showing, um, let me reshare the other screen. Um, so if we switch back to my console here, you know, an, another way is maybe using this web terminal operator. Um, the downside to the web terminal operator is it drops you into a pod, right? If I, if I look inside of here, you know, I'm, you can see I'm in a fairly limited environment and I don't have access to all of the scripts, all of the things that I might be used to, right? I don't even, oh, I do have Git. Um, but, you know, if I have a bunch of YAML files that I, you know, want to work with on the command line, I have to figure out how to get those in there or, or do other things. So it's helpful for some things. It's not helpful as a general administration tool. Um, so I, I'm sorry to say that I, I don't have a really good answer there. If anybody else has any suggestions, um, I, I would very much welcome them. Um, I'd be interested to see how you all are doing. Uh, our hope nine discipline, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, multiple cube configs, um, and then uh, yeah, do the export. That's what I tend to do in each one of those shell sessions. Um, I don't have it configured anymore, but I used to have uh, like a bash alias for each one of my clusters that would do that cube config export and set that terminal color. Um, you know, kind of a, a bunch of different ways to tackle that all going back to our hope nine suggestion of discipline. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and keep an eye on chat here. Uh, Y'all keep, keep those suggestions flowing in. Um, so I, I would very much be interested in how y'all are tackling that. Um, John Moscow cube dash PS one. Um, that's interesting. I like, I like PowerShell. So anytime we use PowerShell, that could be, that could be entertaining. Uh, so OpenShift 4.9 released GA. Uh, I think the bits actually landed on the mirrors Monday afternoon. Um, so it's been available for a little while now, um, you know, 48 hours, basically. Uh, our hope 9 I think it was you who pointed out that uh, on the releases page, you can see all of that information that's out here. You'll see the fast and the stable releases. Now, one thing to note is that if we were to look at the update process, um, let me post this link just in case... Um, so that's the releases page, which tells you all of the currently available versions and even versions that aren't available anymore and what the active release numbers are. Um, but if we look over here on the update graph, 
I'm going to copy this and paste this into here. So if we look at that update graph, uh, what we can see is if I am on, for example, stable 4.8, and I am currently on, say, the latest stable, 4.8.14, I don't have an update path to 4.9. This is normal. This is expected. Uh, so with the last, and I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, so with the last few updates, we're averaging somewhere around 50 to 55 days for a new release, so in this case 4.9, to be available in the stable upgrade channel. And that was true of 4.7 to 4.8. It was true of 4.6 to 4.7, right? It, it just takes time for the engineering team, the folks who are looking at all of the telemetry, all of the information that's coming in to declare, yes, we want to enable stable updates for, I think it's something like 98, 97 or 98% of clusters that only use the stable channel. However, if you're using the fast channel, so if I switch over here to fast 4.8 and select my same 4.8.14, you'll notice that I can make the leap to 4.9. So updates in, in stable are blocked at the moment. Updates in fast are available. It's important to know that a fast channel update is a supported update. So if you have a test cluster, if you have you know, a non-production cluster, if you really want to be brazen, right? If you have a production cluster that you want to, you know, use on the fast channel, absolutely, you can do that. If something goes wrong, pick up the phone, call us, we'll help you with that. And it was it was a couple of weeks ago with Rob Zomsky. Um, so, you know, Rob correctly pointed out that having clusters in that fast channel, especially, you know, your clusters, customer clusters, uh, is really, really beneficial to us because it helps us to identify those edge cases, those things that uh, we we don't test for or or can't test for. Uh, so if you have a chance, if you have an available cluster um, that, that you don't mind putting on fast or you're willing to test with fast, uh, that would be um, really appreciated. Um, stable 4.8 will never have 4.9. Uh, that's not true. Um, for, it'll eventually have it after, uh, again, that, that roughly two month time period. Um, candidate is not a supported release. That is correct, our hope nine. Um, so candidate releases are um, kind of bleeding edge, if you will. Um, so they, they can have issues come up and uh, we, we don't support those. So if you're, if you're wanting to really kind of lead the way, um, you know, stick with the fast channel so that way you can still get support for all of those updates. Um, you can, I, I think, because I, I worked with one customer, what they had done was they accidentally upgraded to a candidate release. And it just so happened that that candidate release, because so basically once a release is cut, so say, um, let me switch over here to where is my releases page. So if we look in um, the candidate channel down here, so 4.7.34. So you'll notice it's not in fast or stable. So this 4.7.34 won't change now that it's out there. So if there's a bug, if there's an issue, if there's something that happens that we say, you know, no, we, we don't want to put this in the fast. We don't want to put this in the stable, right? It's no longer a, a, a release that we want to promote. It's not going to change. So if you accidentally end up in candidate and, you know, the, then but you didn't mean to, um, and I worked with a customer who did this, essentially you would wait until the next release happens that does end up in fast. So let's say that 4.7.35 ends up in fast, right? It goes candidate, it ends up at fast. So you would be able to use the candidate channel to update to 4.7.35, then change your channel to either fast or stable, whichever one maps up with that, and then go from there. Uh, so it is possible to kind of re you know, steer yourself back off of that path if you need to. Um, HomeLad has been on fast for a while. Yes, same here. Um, although I will say, Stephen, that I, I don't often um, I don't often run real workload in my home lab. Um, I probably should do that more. I should move some of my stuff off of the uh, other servers that are running mostly Podman stuff on Fedora, um, and maybe start doing that in my home lab. Um, 
is proactively checking Bugzilla to see what is addressed in a particular fast release worth it beforehand? Uh, yes, I would I would say um, definitely do that. You can also check the errata um, or the release notes. I don't. I think the release notes get updated when it goes into the fast channel because it's supported at that point. Um, but yeah, it, sometimes the you know Bugzilla can be a little overwhelming and not always clear, um, particularly if you're um, you know, we have as, as an employee, you can see the hidden comments, which sometimes provide uh, better information about what's happening. Um, if you can't see those, it can be a little confusing to go from, I have an issue. And then, so, you know, it, comment one, I have an issue, comment 37, issue resolved, and everything in between is all hidden because it contains customer data or something like that. Um, so BZ isn't always, or Bugzilla isn't always the best place, but it is an option. Um, I always suggest errata, even though it can be a little, um, uh, uh, it can also be a little noisy. Um, errata is the next best, fastest way to find out. And then as our Hope 9 pointed out, uh, the release notes. The release notes will be the, the easy to read, the, the best way to digest method. Um, and I'll, I'll even throw our account teams under the bus. Uh, talk to your Red Hat account team. Right? They, they should be keeping up with that type of stuff. So you can always send them an email and be like, hey, you know, I saw this release happened or I see this is happening or I have this, you know, this issue or whatever. Can you tell me whether or not it's fixed? Um, okay. Uh, so yes, 4.9 is available now. Updates in stable are not available yet. Updates are available in fast. Fast is fully supported. Definitely. If you have the time, uh, you know, we'd love to see you adopt those. Or if you have a cluster that you can use, we'd love to see you, uh, use fast. That way we can get that telemetry and really make good decisions about what's happening. Um, so what are some of the things that have happened inside of 4.9? What are some of the things that I think are uh, relevant to us as administrators? So I'm going to walk through a couple of things here, but, um, you know, that I don't really have a good visual of or anything like that. But one of the things that I want to highlight or showcase is single node OpenShift. So you've heard me talk about um, in a couple of episodes now or a couple of streams now, uh, I've been using single node OpenShift clusters just as kind of testing, right? Validating that you can do it. And single node OpenShift has been available since the 4.9 timeframe. Here's the, I was already on the window I was looking for. Uh, so they've been available since the 4.8 timeframe, maybe even 4.7 through the assisted installer. So if I come here to my clusters view and I go to create cluster and I go to the data center, you see we have this assisted installer. So assisted installer itself is technology preview. Uh, we did a, uh, we've done a couple of streams on it now with Reese Oxenham. Um, I'll dig up the links and include those in the blog post. Uh, but the goal here is effectively to provide a really easy, really simple way to deploy your cluster, right? You don't have to worry about you know, creating an install config.yaml, you don't have to go through this process of, you know, generating ignition files and all that other stuff. All of that is kind of removed. And instead I create this, you know, use this interface to define everything that I need for my cluster. In this case, I'm gonna call it single node OpenShift snow. I want to choose this snow and down here I can select 4.9.0. So as of OpenShift 4.9, single node OpenShift is generally available. It is fully supported. Uh, and you can use assisted installer in order to deploy that. So if I click the next over here, what will happen is it will say generate discovery ISO. It will give me an ISO, right? If I click the button down here, I'm surprised it didn't gripe at me about not providing an SSH key. You do want to do that. So it'll generate this ISO, I can download that. Uh, once I do that, I boot my node to that ISO and then it will appear in the list here. I can choose to make configuration edits. So do things like set the host name if I need to. Um, if I'm deploying a regular cluster, not a single node OpenShift cluster, I can set which nodes are gonna be control plane nodes, which nodes are going to be you know standard compute nodes, so on and so forth. And then click the go button and it will deploy that cluster for me. So with single node OpenShift, um, one of the things that's important here is assisted installer will enforce this bare minimum. It will not deploy unless you have at least eight cores and 32 gigabytes of RAM. So if you have something less than that, so say, you know, 16 gigabytes of memory and four CPUs, uh, you know, four, six CPUs, 24 gigabytes of memory, whatever that happens to be, 
you can probably deploy single node OpenShift. You won't have a lot of room left over for applications or anything, but you can probably deploy. I haven't tested it with the, the 4 and 16. Um, I wouldn't go any lower than that. Um, but it is an option if you use the command line method. So what is the command line method you may be thinking to yourself? Uh, and it's pretty straightforward. So let me switch over to my uh, terminal here. And you might have noticed that I was already in this SNO directory single node OpenShift. Uh, so please let me know if this is too small for y'all to see. Um, so if we look inside of this directory, I have an install config inside of here. So I'm going to do this, edit my install config without a pull secret this time. So this install config looks to be pretty standard, right? So up at the top, I've got my standard, you know, base domain definition. Um, down below, I'm defining my network information. So it's, I'm using OVN Kubernetes with a uh, standard machine network. This is just my, uh, uh, whatever the subnet is for the, the network I am deploying this node to. Um, for my compute stanza, you'll notice that I have replicas set to zero. And my control plane stanza replicas set to one. So I'm deploying a single node OpenShift. I must have the platform set to none. We don't currently support deploying to, uh, you know, with a cloud provider integration or anything like that. I think it will technically work, um, but again, it's not supported. So I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Certainly not in a production instance. And then importantly, we have this bootstrap in place stanza. So I'm going to tell it, I want you to install CoreOS to this device on my host. So this is the important part because I've only got one node and I'm going to boot that node. It's going to bootstrap in place as the title suggests there. And then it will reboot and then come up as a standard, right? That single node combined control plane and compute node instance. Uh, after that comes the standard pull secret and SSH key. So we can exit out of here. I can do my, um, so open shift install, explain, install config. Um, and just to show you here, I'm using open shift install typewrite. I am using version 4.9. So I just pulled this this morning, I think. Um, so I can do that install or excuse me, that explain. And if I look up here, I have this now have this bootstrap in place option, right? So it, it kind of walks through all of the things that I need to here. So I can go to the explain install config dot bootstrap in place. And it tells me, oh, this is the installation disk that you're going to use for core OS installer. So with that out of the way, let's see what this actually looks like. So inside of my cluster directory here, I have an install config.yaml. This one does have a uh, pull secret, so we're not going to look at that one. And I want to do an open shift install, create, and let me pull up my cheat sheet real quick. Um, open shift install, create single node ignition config. What that's going to do, and we'll go ahead and let it generate that. What that's going to do is it's going to create a single ignition config that will provide into our node. We can see inside of here, standard stuff when I run OpenShift install, it generates the auth directory. If I look inside of there, it's got the kube admin password and kube config, just like any other install. But we only have this one ignition file uh, and they very, um, a very not so subtly hint where they expect you to use this with, um, which is the live ISO. So great, I now have this bootstrap. If I were to look at it, um, uh, yeah. If I were to look at it, it is an ignition file, right? Uh, here, we'll do a JQ on that bootstrap, wipe to more. Well, if I knew how to use JQ, Christian's shaking his head at me if he's watching or listening. Um, anyways, I won't actually show that then because I don't want to dilly-dally too much since we're running out of time. Um, but it's a standard ignition file that goes through and it includes everything that that 
bootstrap in place node needs. So the next thing that we need to do is figure out how we're going to get this ignition file to our node. Now, historically or typically, we would do something like attach it as a VM option if I'm doing you know, a vSphere UPI IPI deployment, or if I'm doing a non-integrated deployment, I would host it on a web server. And you can still do that. You can put it on a web server if you want. But it's going to be substantially easier if we add this to the ISO that we intend to attach to our host. And we have a utility specifically to do that. Uh, so the first thing I want to do here is I want to grab that live ISO. So all I'm doing here is using a wget to pull down the uh, 4.9.latest uh, live ISO here. So we'll, we'll hit go on that. We'll let the internet pull that down to us. Um, really testing my internet here. I'll look at uh, chat while that's happening. Yeah, DMI3, yeah, what do we do on this OpenShift stream? We, well, we install OpenShift. I, I wish I could say that I remember the last week that went by that I didn't install OpenShift, and I honestly cannot. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, so once this pulls down, we're going to use the CoreOS install, or excuse me, CoreOS installer command. Uh, so let me show where I got that from real quick. Switch back to our web browser window. And if we go to the mirror, so I'm going to open a new tab, go to mirror dot. Oh, I don't have it in the history here. Bring it up in my other browser instance. If I go to the mirror here, and this is accessible um, if you go to uh, this guy. Uh, so if I go to downloads and I look for um, any one of these, the link that it'll provide for this is this mirror. Um, but if I go to the mirror and I select OpenShift 4 and I select clients, you'll see this CoreOS installer. Uh, so all I've done is pull down this CoreOS installer binary. And that is what I have, um, or that, that is what I'm going to be using here in just a moment. So let's reshare our terminal window because that download should be done, and it is. Uh, so now I have in my directory, I have my ignition file, and I have my live ISO. So now I want to use CoreOS installer to add the ignition file to the ISO. So let me find my cheat sheet here. We'll use this CoreOS installer ISO ignition embed going to force it using this ignition file, which I see that I have the wrong location there. So we're going to use this ignition file, and we're going to add it to this ISO. So we'll hit enter, hit enter there, and it comes back almost immediately with no output. So we can do an echo on dollar sign question mark to verify that the output of the last command was successful, right? Return code zero. And now I have my, my file, right? We can see that it was updated, right? It went from October 18th to October 20th. So I've got an ISO, great. What do I do with it now? So in this instance, I'm gonna attach it to a virtual machine. Uh, so I happen to have a, uh, I'm using vSphere today. I've got an NFS data store just for the sake of simplicity. I'm just gonna copy that over to the NFS data store, um, which I have mounted on this host, do a CP of, the live CD to here. That'll take just a second to copy over. And while that is finishing up, we'll switch back to our browser window. All right, so let's log into our vSphere host. A couple of things to notice here. Um, if I go to my NFS blue data store and browse, I have this lovely Arcos live ISO image that we just created. What I'm going to do is take my single node OpenShift instance, and I'm going to attach that data store ISO file. I want it to come from this data store. We'll select that one. 
I want it to connect at power on and we'll select the connect here. And now when I power this guy on and select the boot device as that CD-ROM, it's going to boot to our CoreOS Live CD. Now I could edit this, right? So I can hit um, tab here and I can edit this to do my standard IP equals, you know, assign an IP address, a static IP address to it if I need to. Um, I can also, if I so choose, instead of adding that ignition file in here, I can just boot to the live ISO. I can use NM2E, NMCLI to edit the network config, however complex it may be, uh, and then provide the location of that uh, ignition file from a web server and have it install CoreOS that way. Both of those will work fine if you need to. I happen to be using a DHCP reservation for mine, so I'm just gonna let it boot. But effectively what it's gonna do here is go through and install CoreOS, right? It's first thing it'll do here is uh, install CoreOS. It'll then do the bootstrap process. It'll then go through and do everything else that it normally would for an OpenShift install. You can see it's already pulled that. One thing that I didn't uh, talk about here is the prerequisites. Um, so prerequisites, you just need to have DNS entries. Um, so you need to have a, a DNS entry for the node name itself. So you can see I have this SNO dash node zero. Uh, you need one for the standard API, API int, and start apps that all point to that same uh, entry. That's really it. It's pretty straightforward. You need those DNS entries regardless of whether you install this way uh, with the ISO kind of from the CLI or whether you install with assisted installer. Um, I will post, uh, so Ben Schmaus, uh, who was on the stream briefly a couple of weeks ago, he created a blog post that walks through a lot of this stuff for disconnected installs. Um, so same principle with disconnected, you just leave out the disconnected part of the install config. Um, so he's got a great blog post that walks through all of this in much more detail. I'll link that from the blog post for this stream as well. Just checking up on chat here. Relate worker nodes. Um, yes, thank you, Stephanie, for highlighting that. Uh, some other things that we'll talk about while this is doing its thing. Um, and what I'll do is, where'd my window go? So while that's doing its thing, I'm going to switch over to my SSH window here because I can do an open shift install, wait for uh, bootstrap complete. And you can see it's already gotten past the, you know, it's it's in the process of bootstrapping right now. So while that's up, um, I'll talk about a few other things that I wanted to highlight here. Um, moving windows around. Uh, so if you happen to be using RHEL 7 worker nodes today, uh, so this is not uncommon, um, although it is not always something that we suggest because RHEL 7 worker nodes can't be managed through machine config the same way that CoreOS nodes can. But uh, if you are using RHEL 7 worker nodes, those are now deprecated. Um, so I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to hop back and I'm going to share my browser window again. That one. So if we look over here, um, one of these guys has what I'm looking for. At least I thought. I will use this one. Uh, so RHEL. Eight, uh, so RHEL eight worker nodes are now supported for compute machines. And if we come up here to the deprecated features, apologies for scrolling really fast on y'all. If I look for the deprecated and removed features, you'll notice down here, bring your own RHEL seven commute, compute machines is and has been deprecated. So the expectation is that now that RHEL eight worker nodes are supported, we should all be migrating to RHEL 8, uh, and then eventually support for those RHEL 7 worker nodes will be removed. Uh, so I don't know the precise release that that'll happen in, but just be aware that it's probably not far away. Uh, one thing to note, you do have to, you can't update in place those RHEL 7 nodes. You do need to create new RHEL 8 nodes and then join those to the cluster. Um, let's see, other things. Um, oh, so one of the tabs that I did have up here is this um, VMware hardware version uh, 13 is deprecated. So essentially the version that shipped with uh, version, well, this says 6.7 update two. So the reason for this is ultimately CSI. Uh, so if you aren't aware, um, 
CSI or right, the entry storage drivers are being ejected. They're being deprecated and removed from Kubernetes itself, which means that they will also be removed from OpenShift. So with OpenShift 4.8, we shipped a tech preview of the vSphere CSI driver from Red Hat. It continues to be in tech preview with 4.9. Uh, right now, what I'm being told is that it's expected to go GA in 4.10, but will be optional in 4.10. So CSI integration with vSphere requires virtual hardware, which is an oxymoron, uh, to be at least version 15 or later. So if you are on version 13, uh, which essentially if you've done like an IPI install and you haven't modified the template that it uses or anything like that. Um, so if you haven't updated that, now's the time to begin doing that. I don't know if we have it documented anywhere. I know I'm working on some things that we're gonna get published on how to do that. Uh, the short version is essentially you shut down the node. So do a cordon and drain, power off the nodes, you right click it and then say update virtual hardware version. Uh, and you can go to anything version 15 or later and then turn it back on when it comes back into the cluster, uh, uncordon it and move on to the next one. So it's a bit of a hassle. You know, it's, it's not um, right now, the way that I just described is manual. I don't know if we will be automating that. Um, you can update the template that you use for your machine sets. So update, update that template virtual machine to at least version 15. So that way, when you create those machine sets, scale up, scale down, right? All of that will be um, taken care of. Actually, I guess that is an automated way of doing it. If you update the template, you can scale up the machine set. All of the new VMs that are created would be the new version. And then you can go back and remove the original VMs. Um, so that is one way to do it. Uh, other things. Um, oh, this is one that uh, a couple of people have asked about. Um, can you customize the routes that are used for uh, OAuth for the console, et cetera? Um, so if we look in my cluster over here and I go down to networking and routes and I want to show all projects, you can see, for example, that I have this OAuth OpenShift route and it's over here, it's OAuth-OpenShift.apps.clusterName. Uh, we've also got the console route, right? Console-openshift-console. So you can customize these now. So if you just want console.apps or, or whatever that happens to be, um, you can customize that in a couple of different ways. So over here in the docs, I'm going to see if we see if we posted that one yet or not. I'm going to post that one. So over here in the docs, you can see that we edit the ingress config for the cluster, and then we set this component route. You can do this for, you can see here, this is the console. You can do this for the download route. You can also do this for the OAuth route. Uh, and that includes things like providing custom secrets or excuse me, uh, uh, certificates, right? So serving cert key pair. So you can customize those now in a fully supported way. You can change all of those to make it match whatever your scheme happens to be. Uh, somebody on the stream a couple of weeks ago was asking about, you know, how do I have two clusters that use the same, you know, subdomain name? Well, this is how you do it. This is the fix to that. So fortunately, that one was was already well on the way. So that's an, an easy answer now that 4.9 happens to be released. Um, yeah, Stephen Reeves, finally. Um, the next thing that I wanted to highlight, and I should probably check on my cluster here. Nope, it's still in the process of bootstrapping. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to highlight is we have changed the way that etcd does defragmentation. So let's take a step back. Uh, so etcd is the data store that is used for everything on the control plane, right? It, it maintains the state of the OpenShift Kubernetes really configuration. So all of the deployments, pods, services, routes, right? all of that stuff exists inside of there. So etcd can grow in size. You know, if you think of it as being a database, right? It grows in size and over time it can get defragmented. And defragmented here means that the data is spread out and, or fragmented rather, it means that it's spread out and there's gaps inside of it. So it can consume a lot of extra space, even though there may be, you know, free space interspersed throughout, uh, as well as it can increase things like, um, you know, latency as it's having to find that. So historically with OpenShift 4, 
SED defragmentation happened when the control plane nodes were rebooted. The expectation was that, you know, hey, we release a new version roughly every two weeks. So most folks will be rebooting their control plane nodes every two to four to six weeks. Uh, it probably won't be an issue, right? Um, you know, it'll get defragmented when the node comes back up and then, you know, everything will be great. So it turns out, as you might expect, as we've seen more folks uh, uh, using larger and larger cluster sizes, um, the, da the database, etcd, can get fragmented faster and in between those times. So with 4.9, what they've done is basically added functionality to the etcd cluster operator to periodically defragment etcd based off of several criteria. Uh, so they talked about this. There was a dedicated slide for this in the What's New session. I'll link to that um, because it has some additional details on like what those uh, criteria, what those thresholds are. I think it's like 45% defragmentation is the major one, or a fragmentation, rather. Um, I'm looking at the word defragment, um, and I keep saying that instead of fragment. Uh, anyways, so I'll, I'll link to that slide because um, it's available publicly, uh, so that way you can see details there. But just be aware that you may see this type of activity happening. Um, it can cause short-term latency spikes in etcd as it goes through and does that process. Um, but again, they should be short-term. And then afterwards, hopefully, it drops the total or the, the overall latency down below or down lower than it was. Um, let's see, checking on uh, how to find which runtime is currently being used in the cluster from MS. Uh, so that's an easy one. With OpenShift, it is always going to be Creo or Cryo. Um, that is the only one that we use, the only one that is supported. Um, our hope nine, yes, like vacuum um, for Postgres. Um, Sala, um, should the APIs be updated automatically with 1.22? Yes. Um, so keep in mind, there's two things to consider here. Uh, so one is what's using the APIs, and two is the APIs themselves. So the APIs with 1.22, uh, Kubernetes 1.22, OpenShift 4.9, they will be updated, right? And I think if we go for, if we search for API, um, I thought there was a, oh, I'm looking in the wrong place. That would be why. So API, dip, nope. Anyway, somewhere in the release notes here, there is, a lot of uh, yep, operator lifecycle manager, right? Talking about significant number of V1 beta one APIs have been removed. So if I click down here, let me post this into the chat real quick. So all of these APIs have been deprecated and ultimately removed. So Kubernetes OpenShift no longer supports these V1 beta one APIs, but that doesn't mean that you might not have something that is trying to use those. So with, if you have OpenShift 4.8 today, it will block updates to 4.9 if you have anything using those. Uh, so I would recommend we did a, a dedicated stream to that. Let me dig up that link real quick because I just sent it out to somebody this morning. Um, so if we look at this guy, and I will post that here into chat, as well as bring it up. So this blog post talks about the stream that we had dedicated specifically to these. So Rob Zumsky um, talks about and demos exactly how to go and look and see which of those APIs are being used um, by what and what they're being used by so that you can go and find those things. You know, maybe it's an application developer and you know, shame them into updating their code to use the correct uh, versions. Uh, if it is something from Red Hat, uh, we are, I think we are now at the last I heard, which was last Friday, we had 62 of 64 Red Hat operators that were OpenShift 4.9 compliant. And those last two expected to be compliant like this week. Um, so long before OpenShift 4.9, you know, 4.8 to 4.9 updates go stable, um, they'll be available. Uh, everything will be good there. We're working with our partners. Um, I've seen a number of emails between our partner management teams and the partners for the ones that I interact with saying, hey, did you know your operator is still using these APIs? Because you should probably fix this. Um, so 
all of those are getting updated. Just keep an eye on that. Um, again, OpenShift itself won't let you update if you're using one of those APIs that uh, that won't work with 4.9 slash Kubernetes 1.22. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, please be sure or please feel free to uh, clarify. Um, yeah, JP Dade, I, th I think you were one of the people who asked me for that link this morning. So um, a lot of changes, Stephen Reeves already on the V1. Yep. Yeah. So all of the ones that were removed, they, they've basically moved from a V1 beta to basically V1. Uh, so it's just a, a generally available API. And many of them have been deprecated for a lot of versions as well. Um, I think I made the joke with Rob Zumsky of like back in the early Kubernetes, like 1.345 days when there was pet sets, right? Pet sets were the original name for what we now call stateful sets, um, you know, get, getting rid of all that cruft. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let me check this guy real quick. No, my, my cluster is still bootstrapping, so I won't, there's nothing really exciting to show there, but just know that it does, um, work exactly as I expected. I tested it yesterday. Um, so I, I verified it. I think we've got a video for it. If not, I think we're working on a video for that. Uh, if that's up before I post the blog post, um, this week, I'll be sure to link to that. But other than that, um, you know, we're, we're just a couple minutes past our normal ending time. So we're uh, actually seven minutes past. Wow. Time gets away from me. So uh, we're a little running a little bit over. Uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you happen to have come in. That's all the stuff that I had to talk about today. Actually, it's not. I do have a couple of other things, but I'm not going to spend the next, um, I'm, I'm not going to go too much over um, to talk about those in particular Metal LB. So we'll talk about Metal LB with OpenShift 4.9 uh, in an upcoming episode probably two weeks from now. Again, there will be no stream next week, um, but be sure to keep an eye on all of the other streams that we have going on here. So uh, Rashid, uh, when is 3.11 going to be end of life? Um, I want to say it is next year. So if we do an open shift life cycle uh, and we click on this guy, and up at the top, so the default search result you'll get, at least with DuckDuckGo, is for um, OpenShift 4. So at the top here, it has this link for non-current OpenShift versions. So this will take us back to V3. And if I scroll down here, June 2022 is when 3.11 uh, will reach end of maintenance and uh, no longer be supported. And then it is in this, uh, actually, that's not true. It's not no longer supported. It no longer receives um, patches or anything like that. So the end of extended life phase, which is exp explained right here, ends in 2024. So extended life phase, um, Andrew's interpretation, please read this for yourself, interpret it for yourself, ask your account team for clarification if you needed. Andrew's interpretation is essentially, you can download the bits, you can call us if it's something we already know about or something we know how to already know how to fix. We'll help you with that. If it's something new, right? If there's a new bug that's discovered, there, you know, you can see up here during this phase, no bug fixes, security fixes, certifications, hardware enablement, feature enhancements, or root cause analysis. So basically, if it's something that we don't already know about, there's there's nothing we can do. Um, so. I would definitely, you know, I have been personally recommending to folks, you know, make your plans to update to get off of OpenShift 3.11 before this June 2022 date. Um, if you happen to go over that, um, there's nothing wrong with that, um, but just be aware of the implications that that has to uh, support and what you can get from it. Okay, so... Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you joining. Um, I, I know that this one has been, um, at least for me, it's been a little more stressful um, because Chris hasn't been here to kind of keep me on track. Um, but it's also been a little less stressful because I've had Stephanie in the background helping me. So thank you very much, everybody. Really do appreciate you tuning in today. If you have any questions that we didn't get addressed that uh, come up as you're watching this, you know, after the live stream, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach me at Practical Andrew on Twitter or andrew.sullivan at redhat.com via email. You can contact me anytime. Um, the worst thing that's going to happen is just like here on the stream, I might say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let's find the right people and, and get you an answer for that. So uh, I will see everybody in two weeks. Until then, stay safe. Have a great rest of your week.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another episode. Working on open shift. And, and sometimes we have This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it, believes in the place of It's actually a piece of the component for your get-ups. Everybody has something that they can say. On top of the Red Hat portfolio. 